Now, one of the most recognizable characters, I think, over the last 80-some years is the star of the 1940 film, Pinocchio. Pinocchio, if you don't know, or just to refresh your memory if it's been a while, Pinocchio was first a wooden puppet, right? Carved by Geppetto, his father, who wished that Pinocchio was a real boy. That was his wish. You know, he wished that he had a son. Pinocchio then becomes almost a boy, almost because he, he's able to speak and to move on his own, but not fully because he's still made of wood. And so the way that the story goes is that Pinocchio wants more than anything to become a real boy. Does that sound familiar? Does anybody remember the story of Pinocchio? Did anybody watch, see the movie, maybe read the book? Any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's good. Well, the, the main thing that Pinocchio wants is, is that he wants to be a real boy, and they say if he can just be good, you know, he can prove that he can be good, then the, they'll turn him into a real boy. So he sets out with his focus, determined to become a real boy. Now, on the way to school, if you remember, he's there, and here comes Honest John. And Honest John says he's going to help Pinocchio in many different ways. But one way is that he diagnoses Pinocchio with being allergic. What is Pinocchio allergic to? We're never told. John just says, you're allergic, and the cure is a vacation. Does anybody feel like they could use the cure of a vacation right now? Yeah. A few of you. The rest of you, well, God love you. You're just enjoying life, and you don't need to go on vacation. God bless you. That's awesome. Uh, but, but he says, the cure for you being allergic is that you need a vacation to Pleasure Island. So John describes Pleasure Island as a land for boys where every day is a holiday, right? And no one will tell them what to do. Man, is there anything else that a kid wants to hear that they, they, no one's going to tell them what to do? I know that just this morning we had a kid that wanted to not be told what to do, and so... We love her anyway, but uh, anyway, um, that's what he's told. Go to this island, and you can do whatever you whatever you want to do. So Pinocchio goes, if you remember the story, and he enjoys everything that the island has to offer. But the thing about the island, though, is once you're there, Pinocchio gets completely distracted from what he really wanted. What did he really want to be? A real boy. But when he's on the island engaged in everything there, he completely forgets what he's supposed to be doing. He's distracted from his friend Jiminy Cricket, who was supposed to help him know the difference between right and wrong. He was distracted from becoming a real boy because he's pulled into all this stuff. And he was distracted from who he is becoming instead. Which, if you remember, he starts to grow ears and a tail and a big overbite. As we open the Bible to the end of, of 1 Peter this morning, we find the New Testament uh, writer giving a full, final encouragement and warning to his readers that they not ignore the powers that are at work, that they not get distracted by the tactics, but instead remain focused and faithful into who they are becoming in Christ. Do not get distracted by everything else. Don't get distracted as if you're on Pleasure Island, but instead stay focused on who you want to become, just like Pinocchio wanted to become a, a real boy. So as readers today, what does this mean? Do you ever find yourself so wrapped up in the whirlwind of life that you might lose track of kind of the bigger things going on in life? I mean, whether there's the hourly demands of a job or the minute-by-minute -minute attention that's needed by a little one, or even a few minutes you might steal away to kind of disengage from the chaos of life to rest your mind and your emotions, sitting down maybe with a long sigh to just engage a screen for just a little bit. If that's you, if that's us, if that's any of us today, then I think Peter is speaking to us as much as he was to his first century audience here. And let's see what Peter has to say, beginning uh, in the fifth chapter in the eighth verse. Here's what Peter says. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So Peter has spent more than four chapters of writing about, writing about persecution, writing about suffering, about how to live like Christ despite the world around us. So at this point, when we get to Peter 5, 8, what he's doing is he's shaking his readers, he's slapping them in the face, and he's saying, stay alert, don't fall asleep, don't be lulled to sleep by the daily grind of life. Some translations say things like, be sober-minded and alert. Others might say, be self-controlled and vigilant. And so what Peter has here, it's a wake-up call to take what he's about to say very seriously.
Do you have a favorite cartoon that you grew up watching on Saturday mornings or maybe in afternoons after school? Anybody ever watch cartoons? Let's start there. <laughs> okay. All right. Just making sure. Just, what was your favorite? Howdy Doody. Road Runner, Bugs Bunny. Mighty Mouse. Tom and Jerry. Any others? Lone Ranger. All right. Well, one of my favorite growing up was Scooby-Doo. And what Peter is about to say here, it's kind of like the end of Scooby-Doo. I don't know if you ever watched that or if you had kids that watched that or grandkids that watched it or anything like that. But, but Scooby-Doo, about every episode, there was a mystery. And there was some kind of monster or some kind of thing that was terrorizing some group of people. And so here we just show up Scooby and the gang to solve the mystery. And after some fun hijinks of running around, they'd capture the monster or the whatever it was at the end of the show, and the moment of truth would come. Who was the person who was behind all of the issues? And boom, they pull off the mask, right? And zoinks, it would be like this guilty party that they had met earlier in the show, and they'd say, what? It's, you know, mean old Mr. Mustard, or I don't know, whatever. You know, they'd say, oh, it's that guy, I can't believe it. And the, the guy at the end, when they pulled the mask off, or a woman at the end, when they pulled the mask off, would always say, and I would, I would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for you pesky kids and your dog. So after spending all this time of writing about the trials and the troubles of his readers, Peter is making sure here to unmask the one behind all of the issues that they would face in life. Surprise, surprise, it's the devil. The enemy of your soul is what he's saying. So Peter describes the devil like a lion prowling around waiting for just the right time to pounce and devour you. Now, I know there probably has to be at least one person in this room or watching online that might think, you know what, we're too sophisticated, we're too modern, we're too smart, we're too logical to believe in the devil. But if you were to say that to Peter, he would splash water on your face and say, stay alert, take this seriously, this isn't just fairy tales. The one behind the persecution that I've been writing about for four chapters, the one behind all the trials, the one behind the opposition, it isn't just bad luck, it's the devil. He's saying, here's your one true enemy, and whether you acknowledge him or not, whether you think he's real or not, he is at work against your soul, and he will use any opportunity to pry you away from your relationship with Jesus. And so what Peter's doing is he's pulling off the mask of all the troubles and saying, it's the devil. Now this means two things, I believe. That means, first of all, it frees us to love. You might ask, how does Peter pointing out that the devil is our enemy free us to love? When we come to terms with the fact that the enemy that maybe we face, you know, we're saying, oh man, those people or this person or this whatever it might be, that political party, this person down the street, my neighbors, the person in my house, whatever it might be, the person that, you know what, when, when he reveals that it's not really them, that the enemy isn't them, it's not the group of humans down the road or whatever else, when we recognize that that the enemy is not that person that frees us to love that person. What did Jesus say when he hung on the cross? Father, forgive them. Why? Anybody remember that? For they know not what they do. What he's saying is they don't even know. They don't know why they're doing what they're doing. But when we recognize that more than a physical struggle, there's a, more than a physical struggle going on, but we are caught up in a spiritual war between good and evil, and then the real enemy has been unmasked, then our love and our grace from God can flow from God to us, to another person, and the group of humans over there, because they aren't the enemy. So this unmasking allows us to see the enemy clearly, and it's not the other person. That is really hard to remember in this day and age. You could turn on a news station, it doesn't matter which station, and they are the problem with America. They are the problem with the world. Whoever they might be, they'll tell you who it is and they'll tell you why you should be mad. But P P Peter would say, pull off the mask and say, zoinks, it's not them. They're not the cause of all the problems in your life. And he's saying, so you love them anyway, because they're not the enemy. Not only does it free us to love others because they're not actually the enemy, it gives us a full view of the enemy's tactics 
and his strategies. How many of you were fans of the late, great Kenny Rogers? Not the chicken, but, you know, the musician. What was your favorite Kenny Rogers song? Do you have one? What is it? Islands in the Stream? Everyone just loved Islands in the Stream or nobody listened to Kenny Rogers? No one to hold him. The Gambler, right? The Gambler is one of his most famous songs that he sang. You got to know when to hold him. You got to know when to fold him. You got to know when to walk away and know when to what? Run. If we have to run somewhere, I'm in trouble. Believe it or not, I'm not built for speed. But, you know, Kenny Rogers said you got to know when to run. This strategy that Kenny Rogers is talking about from The Gambler, or this game plan in the song, speaks to recognizing what's happening, right? Saying, recognize, you got to know when to hold them. you got to recognize what's going on enough to know when to hold them. you got to know what's going on. And so he's saying, recognize what is happening and respond appropriately. In the same way in this passage, Peter unmasked the enemy. He finishes pulling into the light what Christians will face in life. So we're not caught off guard. And so when we see, what we see then is that the strategies for the devil to trip us up are persecution or other attacks on us, as well as temptations that, to live in ways destructive to your faith. And so those are the only two tactics of the devil. They're, they're the same tactics. It's persecution, attacks, a lot of it verbal, more than anything, and to tempt you to live in ways that will destroy your soul. Peter actually spoke about this earlier in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. I mean, do we think about that a lot? That there are ways and patterns of behavior that the world will shape us into, that our culture will shape us into, that people that we love will actually shape us into, that will wage war against our very souls. So someone will say, well, is it wrong for me to do this? Well, in the sense of wrong and right, it might not be wrong for you to do that, but that's where you need the Holy Spirit to guide you. But there's a chance that something that can seem just kind of silly might actually wage war against your very soul, according to Peter. And so he's saying, keep away from desires that wage war against your very souls. How will you know what those desires are? Well, you have to be in a relationship with the Holy Spirit for him to speak to you. And so Peter, in all of this, is saying, stay alert. These aren't just mind games. These aren't just Saturday morning cartoons. They aren't just great American songs. The enemy is real, and he's trying to devour you through the only power he has, which is persecution and through distracting you. He wants to bait you to behave in ways contrary to who you are becoming in Christ. The same way that Honest John baited Pinocchio into behave in just whatever on Pleasure Island rather than becoming a real boy. So what is Peter saying? This isn't just about ignoring our Jiminy Cricket. It's that we get distracted from becoming what God created us to be. And instead of growing ears and tail in an overbite, we're actually going to become someone that's separated from Christ. So when we forget that our enemy and the enemy becomes that person or that family or that political party or that class of people, then we are making them the devil and then we feel, we feel free to unleash our anger, our judgment, and our contempt on them. And when we do that, then we are, dis we are parting ways from the way of Jesus. That's when we grow ears. Because we believe like the culture that says that person is your enemy and you need to destroy them. That's when we believe, we behave like people who are not becoming Jesus, but just becoming a regular old donkey. There's another word you can use for that and you'll feel free to. Not only that, but it's a foothold to be swallowed whole. Our life, our reality, and our testimony can consume us in the temporary, rather being wrapped up in the eternal. How many people do you remember, and I don't know, I wasn't here, you'll know, 2020 was an election year. How many people were just consumed with that? I'm sure none of you here, but probably somebody you know. They were so wrapped up in that, they were so consumed in that, they thought, man, if this happens, then it's going to be the end of the world, or if this happens, and on both sides they're saying the same thing. 
You could take off the name and everyone's saying it. If this happens, if they win, then XYZ is going to happen. And the other side saying, if they win, XYZ is going to happen. And we get so caught up and we get so consumed with it, we start hating people based on who they're going to vote for. And Peter is saying that's not the way of Christ. He's saying, don't get distracted by this. Don't get distracted by these things that you think are important. It's not that they're not important, but compared to the eternal glory of God. He's saying, when you look at that, you're mad. You're going to pull a mask off. Zoinks! They're not the enemy. The devil is. He's saying, stay alert. Recognize the real enemy and understand his tactics. Then he writes this. Stand firm against him. Talking about the enemy, the devil. And be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Whoops. To him forever. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that you are who are experiencing is... Let me start again. My purpose in writing you is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. Peter reminds his readers to stand firm and to be strong with their faith. We might be tempted to think that their firmness and their strength come from just kind of gritting our teeth. You know what? Because sometimes that's how we're taught. Just hang in there. Try really hard. But it's actually in our commitment to our faith in Jesus that bears the strength out. It's our faith in Him that is firm. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Didn't we sing that this morning? It's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. So if we are in the joy of the Lord, then that will be our strength. According to the prophet Nehemiah, by the grace of God, the joy of the Lord is our strength. This is the anchor that keeps us from getting blown around by our circumstances. It's the belief that that the unseen is true. Because of God's revelation through His Son, Jesus Christ. Stand firm by the grace of God, he says. Stand firm in the faith that there is more to life than what we see. There's got to be. There's got to be more than what we see. Because our eyes will tell us that, you know what? The whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. But what does the Scripture say? He is making all things new through Jesus Christ. You turn to Revelation, what happens? There's a new heaven and a new earth, and they come together, and they're joined together, and the presence of God fills the whole thing. So are we doomed? No. We have hope because of Jesus Christ. And so we don't just believe our eyes. We believe that even the unseen promises of God are true. That's called faith. If you only believe it when you see it, that wouldn't be called faith. That would be a keen observer, I guess. So he says, stand firm the conviction that Jesus has done a mighty work for you, in you, and through you, all by his grace. This power of grace is the same power that raised Jesus from the grave. And it is more powerful than the devil. So don't give in. The Lord will keep you, is what Peter would say. Give in to what? The temptation and the bait to behave like everyone around you. To get distracted from what is right. To get distracted from what is true. To get distracted from becoming who Jesus created and saved you to become. Don't get distracted. Don't give in. Because it wages war on your soul when you behave like the world around you. Don't get distracted. Don't give in because it will destroy you. You have been called. You have been rescued. You have been adopted. And you are being made new by the power and the grace of His Holy Spirit. So don't give in. You have been set apart by God. And your focus is to be on the risen King, Jesus Christ. For many of us, the devil, I think, has become kind of like a harmless caricature, you know? Like the little cartoon standing on your shoulder. You know, has a pitchfork and maybe a tail. And he's kind of red and has some horns or something. And he whispers in our ears just to, oh, come and have fun. Nobody will notice. Or something that's kind of far away in hell and it doesn't really impact us. It's just kind of a fantasy or something like that. For others of us, we hyper-focus on the devil, right? We blame everything on the, on the devil. We say, oh, that rain today, that devil. We got a flat tire. That devil, he got me my tire. We drive through McDonald's and the ice cream machine is broke down again. 
and we're saying, the devil got me. Thank God there's whiteies though, right? Anyway. <laughs> but the reality check that Peter gives here is to remind us to remain in the middle between hyper-focus on the devil and not and ignoring him completely, but to stay alert and aware. This is where the true, there is a true enemy, and it's the devil, and he wants to devour each of us. The question is, will we recognize him, and will we take the easy way out? Now, he might not draw you to the, to the bright lights, loud noises, and free food of Pleasure Island, but the devil is at spiritual war, and the prize is separation of a person's soul from God. That's all he wants. So what are the things that distract you? Maybe you're someone who's never really surrendered your life to Christ. You might believe in him, you might think he's great, but maybe you've never actually surrendered your life to Christ. Maybe you haven't lived this life that Peter is encouraging his readers to be strong. And maybe you thought you were going your own way, but you realize that you're becoming someone you never intended. Have you ever woken up and saying, how in the world did I get here? Maybe you haven't, but I know I have. Now, maybe you didn't grow ears, a tail, and an overbite, but maybe you are feeling empty, or maybe you are feeling alone. Maybe you're feeling worthless. Maybe you're feeling ashamed, or like there's no purpose of life, and even if there was, no one really cares. I want to tell you that if you're hearing that, those are lies from the devil. And that you can turn right here and right now away from things that would tell you that, and you can turn towards Jesus. You don't have to clean yourself up first to meet Jesus. You don't have to journey first into a giant whale or call out for Jiminy Cricket. You only need to call out to Jesus and he will rescue you. If you'll repent, which means to turn away from going your own way to go the way of Jesus, he will forgive you. He will redeem you. He will adopt you. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit and he will transform your heart. And it happens in an instant, but it also happens in a process. Or more and more every day, if you allow him, he will make you more like a son, Jesus Christ. Jesus will take you where you are. So many times we think, well, I got to do these things before I come to Jesus. No, you don't. He meets you where you are. He doesn't say, clean yourself up and come to me. He says, let me pick you up and carry you to my table. He will bring you to him and he will rescue you. Jesus will take you where you are. And give you a new life and a new purpose. He will begin you on a journey to becoming a real man or a real woman as he intended when he created you. Maybe you're saying, hey, I gave my, my life to the Lord a long time ago. But recently you realize that you become distracted. Maybe it's the daily grind just is wearing on you and you're saying, I, I still believe in Jesus, but I don't know where it is. Or maybe you're distracted by your bills. Maybe you're distracted by this pandemic that seems like every time it's going away, it flares back up. Maybe you're distracted by an election, whether it's the last one or the one coming or wherever it might be. Maybe you're distracted by a screen. Maybe you're distracted by your past. Maybe you're distracted by worry or anxiety. Distracted by and caught up in a way of life that everyone else seems to be living. And you can't say you've been alert that instead you could say, I've just been hanging on. Can you just let go of it all and grab onto Jesus? Can you let go of being the sheriff of everything and just grab onto him? Can you remember your calling? Can you remember that you're loved, that, you're, that your value and your worth to God who created you and rescued you? Can you take your eyes off of this world and put them back on the kingdom of God? Can you surrender not just your Sundays, but your Mondays through your Saturdays to Him? Can you surrender your relationships, your friendships, your single life, your married life, your online life, your real life, and allow Jesus to continue to transform you? Can Jesus have your attention? Can He have your focus? Can Jesus just not have your life when you die, but can He also have your life right now? Because that's what he wants. Can you be aware that they, whoever they are, aren't really the enemy? And can that free you instead to love them? Beware of the lion and instead run to the king. One wants to devour you, but one wants to make you whole. One wants to put you in bondage and one wants to set you free. One wants to destroy you, and one wants to make you new. 
One wants to separate and to kill, and one wants to unify and give life abundantly. I know you're smart enough and you're brave enough to choose the king instead of the lion. So let's stay alert. Let's choose Jesus every single day and let's invite others to do the same so that we can live into the life for which he created us. Stay alert. Be awake. Know when to hold him. <laughs> know when to run away. Jesus will get you through. Amen.